I can't even tell you half of it. I can't tell you half of it because that's how much the Lord has blessed me. And I'm going to share a quick testimony and I'm going to get into the word. But I was sharing with the class today how the Lord blessed me. I was on my job. It would be 31 years soon. And God blessed me this December. This year, I'll be retiring. And so, I thank God for that. Because I couldn't see no retirement when I came in. But, the, but the, what I wanted to say is I got promoted nine times on my job. Seven times I got promoted, I wasn't even saved. Amen. So when I was being promoted through the years, I took it for granted. When I got saved, the eighth time I got promoted, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I cried like a baby because I was so grateful. Amen. I was so grateful that God had brought me from a mighty long ways. And he just kept blessing me. So I, I love young men because I want to encourage you to look past your circumstances today. Because this is temporary what you're looking at today. God will take you places you never thought you could go. But I just wanted to say that before I go into the word because the word is going to be a word of encouragement today. And the title of my message today is that your container for your gift is your character. Woo! Your container for your gift is your character. And that gift is gift God give to all his people. And he give them without repentance. But those people that keep his commandments, there's a a case that he can carry your gift in because you have character and it don't have no leaks in it because God will keep you and he'll promote you and he'll have people see you when you don't think they're watching because of your character. Amen. So let us stand. I'm going to pray and then we're going to go into the word. Father God, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Father, and I'm asking you for a special anointing, one that will release your word to your people with clarity and power. I thank you, Father, for your will. I thank you for all your ways, but I thank you for your mercy and your grace and your manifested glory. And Father, I ask that you anoint the ground of our hearts, anoint your word, as seed. Anoint the sword and hide him in a gift that you've given to your body so that we might receive this life-changing revelation of you through your word, under your anointing, with your Holy Spirit. I thank you for it now, Father, and I give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to start in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. Michael, do you have a mic? I want you to help me today with this reading. And we all can read this together. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sin, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of the, this world, according to the princes of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversations in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and word by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. But God is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, have quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Amen. You may be seated. 
Now that particular scripture sums up what I shared with you at the very beginning when I said that I didn't understand how God was operating in my life. When those opportunities came, I never will forget, I got promoted on a particular area of a job and I hadn't even put in for the job. And so I walked in the office to share with, the, with my superintendent because I know I couldn't spend the money. If I had spent the money, I couldn't pay it because I had two kids at home, I was young, just getting started, and I was afraid that if I spend this money, I wouldn't be able to pay it back. So the Lord put it on my heart to talk to the supervisor about it, and the foreman kind of laughed about it. So I said, okay, I need to talk to the superintendent because I can't spend this money. I won't be able to pay it back. So he said, okay, sure, but they knew what was going on, I didn't. So I walked in the office and the superintendent looked at me and said, well, how you doing? I said, wonderful, how you doing? I only been there six months. And uh, I said, well, I'm just here to give you this check back because you have to make some adjustments because it's, I can't pay it back if I cash it because I need all of it. And he said to me, say, son, um, why would you say that? I said, well, I seen you interviewed all these people and I never put in for this job. So I know that you must have made a mistake. He said, no, I didn't make a mistake. So I didn't make a mistake. I interview the people I don't know. I don't need to interview the people who I see every day and they come to work and they do their job. And so to, from that point on, I became a supervisor and that was my motto. I would tell the guys, listen, you get your interview every day. So I'll let you know where you stand. So when the time of promotion come, you won't have to be concerned about who getting it next. Because I'm going to tell you right now who's going to get it and why they deserve it. So you can be upset with me, but here's the way I work. And so that was my policy. And I didn't know about how the word addressed character. But that's all that I ever had because I was brought up in the fear of God. So my father, when he spoke, he wasn't a big speaker. But when he spoke, he could whisper and I could hear him at that back door. And I'd drop what I'm doing and say, yes, sir. And my dad would tell me what he wanted because that's how close I watched him and I listened to him because he meant that much to me. And so that was the natural father. And when God started dealing with my heart, he said, now I gave you him, and I know you love him. And when my father died, I felt like jumping off a cliff. But I knew that wouldn't be the right thing to do. And I knew that wasn't what he wanted me to do. Amen. He loved me too much. But he put the fear in me, and he said, son, you have a wife and a family. I've already reached the mountaintop. Now you go forth with your life and stay married. Take care of your family. That's the most important for a man, to take care of his family. So that was an order. That wasn't an option. So when you live this life as a man, and you take that for granted, the jewel that God gave me, I don't take it for granted because I know when I go around and I look at people's life, and I hear their testimony. I say, Lord, thank you. Because I don't have these problems. Because God wouldn't put no more on you than what you can bear. So he gave me what I could bear. Amen. And I honor God for that. Because some of the struggles that I hear people go through, I thank God that I didn't have to go through that. Amen. But for that, I didn't think I had a testimony. I used to go around and hold my testimony because I didn't have the testimonies that I had other, heard other people share. So, but God said, my relationship is a personal relationship. What I did for you, you tell the world about it and be happy about when you tell it because I did this for you. And then when you share that, they'll understand that it's a reason why God blessed people a certain way. People say favor ain't fair, but favor is fair. God favor those that keep his commandments. And one of the greatest commandments, and God said it, Jesus said it, 
Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbors as you love your own self. People prefer other people. I was guilty. When I was in the old church, I shared with Al here. This is a friend of mine. I used to look up to people. I mean, I still do. But God said, son, it's all right to look up to people because I, I know where I can take them. But I gave you a gift also. And while you looking up at everybody else, you don't even see where I have you in me. But they do. Amen. They could see you clearly because they already know what I showed them. But because you're looking at them, you can't see yourself. And I got a special anointing for your life. But you got to have confidence that is me. Amen. That is me that abides in you and you abide in me. I love you, son, but you got to step out into the faith arena now. Because the, your natural gifts are limited. God can do so much more when you open up to him. And I had to learn how to open up to God to let God use me. Because I always felt less than. And I shared that today in class because many times when I first joined the church, I thought the pastor was the one to get on the pews, stand on the edge of the pew, walk, walk on the pews. Because that's a, that's a culture, that's a tradition. Now, foolishness of preaching is a great thing because it delivers people. But the message in the word can never be changed. The word can never be changed. So no matter how they say it, is the word falling on good ground? And your culture is your value system. What do you value? Do you value entertainment more than you value the word? Because God say, I am the word. So you can't change the word. You can't dilute the word. You speak the word, and the word does the work. One plant, one water, but God gives the increase. So let's go to, uh, Mike, would you go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take one pleasure, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Many times as saints of God, we feel like we are empty. Now, pastor been carrying this load for a long time. And I know you have, and my heart goes out to pastor because he worked day and night. And the Lord put it on my heart to be do more and help him in more areas because I can. God gifted me to do it. But many times I would not do it because I would be looking around the room at the other people. And I was guilty of waiting on someone else that I had confidence in. And God say, just do it. And I know that he gifted me to do it. It's a difference when you can't do it. But it's another thing when you know you can. And so God put it on my heart to say that school over there, that pastor keep envision that school. This is an area that I know. I don't question. This is what I've been doing for 30 years. I know I can do that. Amen. Amen. And God going to bring the souls to the church because these young men are tired of McDonald's and Burger King. The revival will break out in them when they get a skill that they can go get a job making $20 or $30 an hour. That revival will break out because these men will be looking for wives then. Many times what stop us as men for that in that area of looking for a wife is that we feel insufficient. We don't feel our, our, what happens to us many times our confidence is low because we, not, we don't feel valued. Amen. Amen. So many times I've been the man and I've been in this position. Okay. So I'm just speaking from 
a man's point of view, I know men understand what I'm saying, especially those who are in transition and they, don't, they haven't they found their purpose yet and they, they haven't found their gifting areas yet and they're in transition and they're looking at uh, women and they're saying, wow, I would love to approach that one, but if I approach she, she's looking good, she got a good job, look like she's already self-sufficient, so they hold back. They go forth when they feel more confident that they are able to sustain a family. And that's just being a man. And so he said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And when you get weary, we get weary. And the Lord knows when we get to that point. And he always have. He always have a ram in the bush for his people because that builds your faith. I remember I heard a guy speaking on faith. He said, you know, your faith is built, your faith is uh, increased in your struggle. And God showed me something different. He said, no, your faith is revealed in the struggle because I already know you. I created you. So I just have these storms that come in your life to reveal to you what your faith really is because many of us don't know in certain areas of our lives, we don't know if we could take it or not. Amen? But you can only speak from experience. When you speak from experience, I can tell you that I did it. And I've been there, done that, and I've been delivered from it. I'm not talking about what I think. I'm talking about something I experienced. Amen? So many times uh, when we get weary, we tend to get weak and we decide at that point that we're going to quit. That's why you need mentors. Amen. Because pastor, when you continue to plow and you keep going forth, there's a multitude watching you. Your enemies are watching you, but the, those who are low in faith is watching you. And you encourage them when you're going through. And you never quit. That's one thing I can say about my pastor. He never quit. And I admire you for that. Because many people speak the word, but they do not demonstrate it. And when I mean demonstration, I'm talking about when you get ready to make a decision, your decision is made on faith. And if it's not made on faith, I can tell from, a, from across the room. Because that decision, a believer wouldn't have made. So many times you say, oh, I got faith, and you practice, and you can speak well. But when the storm hit, you're the first one off the boat. And so you got to understand, this is real. This is a lifestyle. This is not an entertainment. This is a lifestyle. When you come on this side, it's real. And you got to be for real when you get in this, in this realm. You just can't go around telling people you love the Lord and then you're not speaking to people. And the, the Lord see that. He see it. I was sharing. I was sharing a story yesterday, and uh, it was it was really funny. The pastor caught me when I was talking to John about this this story I was sharing. So he told me, "You share it with the congregation tomorrow." I said, "Okay." <laughs> this is the story. This woman was in love with this man, and he had several women. Okay, and uh, my, I had a brother like that. So my brother was a worldly a worldly man. And um, I still loved him. It didn't change my love because he chose the world. So I tell people, you know, you brag on your brother be, or, or somebody in your family when they make it, but was you bragging on them when they wasn't making it? Now I'm telling you, I love my brother in spite of, because that's my brother. So saying that, he was a womanizer. He learned how to play the field. And um, he, he really grieved my father because my father wanted his sons to have one wife and he wanted him to have his kids and take care of them, period. There was no compromise there for him. And so this, one, this woman was telling this man that, you know, they, she was planning to, marry, to get married and he said, let me just tell you this now. I'm not getting married. He said, I got several girlfriends. I'm not interested in getting married. So she figured... Well, I'm going to keep trying. If I keep doing the things here, eventually 
decide to marry me because he came that close to marry me before. So she started doing a little extra to win his confidence. So in the process of this, she decided to put some antifreeze in his Gatorade. You know, Gatorade is green, and they put the antifreeze in. So this man died. It took a while, because you don't die immediately, but he died. So he died, and she dressed him up in the bed, and you know, because she, she was in love with this man. Now, this sounds gross. It is gross, isn't it? So he decided, I mean, the neighbors decided, well, there's something smelling. So I mean, they kept asking her about this man. We haven't seen him come out. She said, oh, he all right. It got so bad, it was stinking so bad, they had to send some people around there that understood that when the body decomposed, it has a different smell to it. And they went and found this man in the bed. And they pulled him out, and it was a big story about it. But the point is, that's real nasty, isn't it? But God don't like when you don't love other people. That stink to him. You can, you, now, we can relate to that body in the bed stinking. But we can't relate to it when we're not speaking to our neighbors. We don't think that stink in God's nostrils. That stink to him when you don't speak to people and you prefer other people over people. But that stink to him. That's nasty to him. When you love people, your heart is wide open to everybody. Because people don't go to a, a tree that got uh, fruit that's rotten or with worms in it. But when they find out the fruit is good, they go to the tree and they pick from the fruit. And that's what happens when people come to your church, our church. They come in because they know the fruit is good. And it starts at the door. When they walk in that door, you greet them with love. When they sit down in the pews, we greet them with love. We never stop loving on the people because that's what draw the people. And God will fill the house. And you wondering why they filling the houses of these churches. Not because these people are so dynamic. It's the love that draws. Love will draw and fill the house up. People just want to be loved. It's, not in, it's really not in enticing words. If you read the chapter in the same scripture, he says it's not even the enticing words. But it's the love of God that's in you. And your character that draws people. Because they see you from afar. The Bible says we walk in epistles, men see and read us from afar. They see us from across the room. They see us from across the street. Because our decisions going to line up with what we believe. Jesus. If you say you love people and you walk past your neighbor, you don't speak to them, you don't try to help them when they're down, and you say, I love the Lord. And they say, really? I don't want to go to that church. Because they're not coming because they don't see the fruit. See, the fruit is not just being up here as a speaker. The fruit is what you do when nobody is watching. So many of us, we so caught up in people. I was there. I was impressed with people. And God had to deal with me. And he said, son, I want you to always look at people and see them in great places. But don't hold them over me and over yourself. Because I gifted you just as well as I gifted them. And that's what God want us to know. I gifted you also. But you walk around with low self-esteem because you waiting on people to pat you on the back. But you got to get past the people. Because people will see a good thing and turn their back, act like they don't see it. Because they know you blessed. And they can't do nothing about it. Because God did it. When God do something for you, can't nobody do nothing about it. There ain't no use in you being shame about it. I was walking around feeling, and I was blessed. But I felt, why do I feel this way? This guy more talented than me. Why you ain't pick him? God said, I chose you. And I found out later why he wasn't chosen. 
because his character didn't line up. Because he was a self person. You know how you have all this talent, but all you think about is yourself? They not, they not about to share their fruit with nobody else. And then we say, they fully talented, but are they really talented? Because when you're really confident in who you are, you don't mind sharing what you have. Hallelujah. I can give you everything I got, but the Lord going to still provide. And I'm looking for successors at where I work now because I got 11 more months and I'm out the door. I said, Lord, you open up me another door. This here journey is done. So I'm going to do my time here and I'm going to love these people and I'm going to give them everything I can on my way out. But I got to go now. 31 years is long enough. I'm going to read one more scripture. Psalms chapter 1. Amen. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doeth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth it shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Amen. So this is our walk. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So we have to separate ourselves from the world, nor stand in the way of the sinners. We're supposed to make a way for them to come to church, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, stop judging them, and start praying for them. And there's more judgment that goes on in the church than prayer. Because when someone is down and they need help, you need to pray for them and help them. And not be judging them and condemning them. If many times you would have more people with more confidence in faith if you would just speak to them and encourage them and stop talking about them. And the whole church will grow. Because when you see someone grow, it's a delight. When you see children grow, it's a delight. And so when I see the growth, I just get happy because I know the Lord is blessing. And so I want st to stop right here because I'm going to bring our pastor up.